We have been specializing on Bible education, which enables men and women to set things straight. You people don't have things set straight. You don't have an overall pattern. You have knowledge, but you don't know what it's all about. Understanding is a big thing. And to have insight and to have all these things set straight in order and in the order that the Most High God wants them to be in our minds. And uh, you know it's in the Bible where Paul says that all scripture is inspired beneficial for setting things straight. Now, before you came to Gilead, you had many things set straight already, scripturally. But uh, during the five months, we tried to set a few more things straight, including elements. And we examined uh, many of God's laws, didn't we? And we examined maybe hundreds of Christian principles. And then we made a searching study of many Bible prophecies. And all this vast fund of information is in the Bible, not only as knowledge, but with God's Spirit, it also enables us to put all these things in their proper order, set them straight, and uh, therefore give us insight. And then with our hearts devoted to God, we're then set to apply that information. So I hope in the days to come that you'll keep setting things straight. And it's very important. We have another statement by Paul where in Romans he said, uh, does not the potter have authority over the clay to make from the same lump uh, a vessel for honorable use and from the same lump a vessel for dishonorable use? Now, we all know that Jehovah God is that great potter. And we are part of that lump of mankind. Well, now, how has Jehovah God uh, been manipulating this clay or lump of mankind? Well, we know he's been doing that through the Bible, through this wonderful word of truth that we have. And as that word of truth comes upon us, it molds us. And are we letting that Bible mold us, getting things set straight in our minds? Yes, we've gone a long way. And as we've done so, we have reacted correctly and have become vessels or ministers of the living God and have been privileged to perform temple service, sacred service, day and night. Now, the same Bible, the same uh, rugged mankind, on the part of many others, have reacted just the opposite to God's word. They shun it, or they misuse it, they misapply it, they uh, form apostasies from it, or they try to make money by means of the word of God, like the clergy do. And so, the same Bible, upon lumps of humankind, have turned out many, many vessels for dishonorable use and the world is full of them. So let's bear in mind that as the days go on, let's keep being molded by Jehovah God through his word as the right kind of ministerial vessels, vessels that will always be used for an honorable purpose now in this present great work that we have and for the great work beyond Armageddon in the new world to come. Well, it's been a happy privilege during the past five months to be with you here at Gilead. And like the other instructors have said, we certainly pray and hope that Jehovah's blessing will be with you in the days to come. And use aright the knowledge and understanding and wisdom and insight that you received here at Gilead. In David's time, he said, as for Jehovah, he has looked down from heaven itself upon the sons of man to see whether there are any there's anyone existing that has insight and anyone that is seeking Jehovah. Now, David said that 4,000 years, uh, 3,000 years ago. Now, what about today? Jehovah is still looking down from heaven. He's still looking down upon the sons of men. And as he looks down upon us in the years to come, will he too find us 
the students and the instructors and all of us here in the audience, will he find us too having insight, real understanding, having set things straight and continually setting things straight in the days to come? And are we continually seeking Jehovah? That's the great thing. And may the answer be yes for all of us. Thank you, Brother Schroeder. I know that uh, many of our brothers and sisters throughout the world are interested in uh, the affairs going on here this morning, and many have sent messages, and we'll have some of these read this morning by Brother Booth. The first one from St. John's, Newfoundland. Our thoughts are with you on your graduation day. Carboneer Special Pioneers. Next, Barranquilla, Columbia. Special greetings from our National Assembly here with Brother Henschel to you in the 30th class now to graduate. This morning I'd like to leave a thought with you. The um, subject of my talk is hospitality a responsibility. Did you ever knock on a door and hear a voice call out to you and say, come in? So you walked in and the party inside was very friendly. It being a hot day, he offered you a cool glass of water. You might say, well, that hasn't happened very often but it has happened in your life. After you spoke to this uh, individual and talked to him about the kingdom message and uh, observed his pleasantness, whether you placed any literature or not, when you got back to the car or met some of the other publishers of the day, you would say to them, I met a very hospitable man or woman the person was so kind, he was so friendly. His very action, the way he dealt with you, made you remember him. You liked that individual. Why? Because of the person's hospitality. What does hospitality mean? Hospitality means receiving and entertaining strangers or guests. It means to be generous, kind. Hospitality means affording a generous welcome to guests or strangers. And as you study the New World Translation, you will find in it the expression being friendly or kind to strangers. And often in the footnote on that expression, referring to kindness to strangers, you will find the footnote, hospitality. We as a group of people carrying on the work of Jehovah God and preaching the good news certainly must be hospitable. We must love the stranger. Now, it isn't too difficult to be hospitable to a friend of ours, to invite him into our home, to give him gifts, to have him in for dinner. But how often when a person comes to your door that you have never seen, you don't know who he is, why he's there, you've given him a very cold reception. you weren't hospitable. But you like it when you visit people at their homes and they uh, open the door to you or say, come in, and they're free and friendly. It's something that's natural to like. We like to see it in others. Do we see it in ourselves? 
So let us consider for a while hospitality a responsibility. Paul told the Hebrews, let your brotherly love continue. Do not forget kindness to strangers, for through it some unknown to themselves entertained angels. Imagine that. Because some individuals had been hospitable, had been friendly to strangers, they were entertaining angels. And we have occasions set forth in God's word where people actually entertained angels and didn't know it. But they were very kind to them. I think the most inhospitable people in the world are Americans. When you travel in other countries, the East, Latin or South America, most any other part of the world where people do not have the good things of living, as we call them, a higher civilization, but a lower hospitality rate, you'll find that you'll enjoy traveling in other lands. You travel around New York City and stop a stranger and ask him for directions, he most usually shows a of fear, I wish you'd get away, I don't know who you are. <laughs> but when you speak to people in other countries, being a total stranger to them, they'll usually stop and uh, give you all the help they possibly can. And when you missionaries go into foreign countries and knock on a door and a person comes to the door and you stumble through your Spanish or your Korean, or what other uh, language you're trying to use in presenting the message, those people will help you. But let a German who has very broken English go to the door in America or New York City and knock on a door and start talking to him about the message. I'll say, why don't you learn English first? There'll be no help there on the part of the individual to give him the words he wants or be kind enough to listen through what he has to say and sometimes we get discouraged in going from house to house because they pull a little thing through and look at it through their eye and all you see is an eyeball with a dot in the middle <laughs> and you talk to it You don't know what it is behind the door, <laughs> male, female, young, old, dressed or undressed, you haven't the slightest idea what's there, just the little eyes sticking through. <laughs> there's no friendliness, there's no warmth, they're not hospitable. But those people that are behind the doors do not know that a messenger of God is on the other side. And they may be closing out a great blessing, holding it away from them. But because they won't hear us, who are a hospitable class of people, is no reason for us to be discouraged we're trying to find those who love strangers. And we certainly are strangers to the world. We're in it, and we're not a part of it. It's because as an organization, as God's people, we have this attitude of mind of loving strangers, that this work is carried on from one end of the world to the other. And so when Paul here said, do not forget kindness to strangers, we find in the New World Translation, in the footnote, do not forget hospitality. Now let's keep this one thing in mind, that hospitality and the love of strangers is practically one and the same thing. Hospitality doesn't have its strong meaning in love of friends 
love of mother, love of brother, love of sister, love of the brothers in the congregation. While we do show a kindness and a warmth towards all of them and hospitality. That isn't what the word involves. Hospitality involves the loving of the stranger, the person you don't know, and your kindness to that individual. Look what happened to Manoah. Manoah now said to Jehovah's angel, and uh, she didn't know it was the angel, let us please detain you and fix up a kid of the goats before you. But Jehovah's angel said to Manoah, if you detain me, I shall not feed myself upon your bread, but if you will render up a burnt offering to Jehovah, you must offer it up. For Manoah did not know that he was Jehovah's angel. So here the mother of Samson found out about uh, the son she was going to bear, but she didn't know she was talking to a stranger. But look at the warmth. Here's a total stranger comes to her home and she's ready to fix up a meal. That was a common practice amongst the people of uh, the countries around Palestine. And when we read the scripture about a person going from house to house and you being welcomed in uh, to sit down, and the Lord said in his counsel to those who were going from house to house, if you receive their peace and go into their home and they offer you food and drink, well then don't go from another house to another house. Those that welcome you, stay with them because uh, certainly the labor is worthy of worthy of the food and the drink that is provided to that person. Real hospitality was shown in those countries. People were not afraid to ask them to stay overnight. Persons they never saw, they never met. But today, uh, the natural tendency and teaching in our schools and the training we give individuals is always to be afraid of everybody. Of course, the nations give us good cause to be fearful because of the actions that take place on the street with the delinquency of children, with the delinquency of grown ups with the murderous instinct in the minds of people you never know who you're going to meet up with. And so we're trained to withdraw, to, uh, to be afraid of people, to hate them, to show no friendliness at all because if I do, they're going to take advantage of me. But that's the world. We're not of the world. Just because we happen to live in it is no reason that we should be like it. And if we happen to be of the tendency to be fearful and withdraw from the stranger, then the devil is accomplishing his purpose. He's making us something that Jehovah doesn't want us to be. We should be friendly, hospitable people to all not just our own brothers. Look what happened to Abraham. As recorded in Genesis 18th chapter 1 to 3, afterward Jehovah appeared to him, Abraham, among the big trees of Maramri, while he was sitting at the entrance of the tent about at the heat of the day. When he raised his eyes, then he looked, and there three men were standing some distance from him. When he caught sight of them, he began running to meet them from the entrance of the tent and proceeded to bow down to the earth. What did he do? First of all, he offered them fresh water. Then he offered to arrange for the washing of their feet. He asked them to recline there under the tree in the shade. He wanted to have them eat some bread, so he rushes into Sarah and he says, get three sea measures of fine flour, knead the dough and make round cakes. Then he got a tender and good ox, had that slaughtered, prepared a feast for these strangers, and he obtained good butter and milk. These were three strangers to Abraham, but Abraham showed hospitality. They turned out to be angels, representatives of God. Remember Lot, a relative of Abraham, down there in Sodom and Gomorrah? 
he entertained angels. He protected them from the mob. He didn't have to protect them the way he did. They could have just disappeared and vanished in the heavens again. But no, he was ready to offer his own daughters to that raging mob just to protect two angels that had far more power than Lot. He was hospitable. Yes, they entertained angels. And it may be that we, if we show hospitality to individuals at all times, we may be entertaining a very important personage within Jehovah's organization. Or some individual that will come out of the world, like a Paul, like a Timothy, an individual that will pull away from the world and become a strong leader within Jehovah's organization. Why then should we ever show distrust or hatred or offishness to individuals that we have an opportunity to talk to? Some of these persons that we have witnessed to in times past have come into the Lord's organization and now they may be your congregational servant. They may be your overseer. Why? Because you showed hospitality to them. They were people that were sighing and crying and God could use them. And they wanted to be used. And maybe by your initial teaching and training, they have grown up in Jehovah's organization until some of them today may be branch servants, district servants, circuit servants, sent off into foreign assignments because of your love, your warmth, your friendliness expressed to that individual. Now, if we weren't that way, think of what we would miss in life. Yes, Abraham and Lot and Manoah, they spoke to angels. They were kind, welcomed them, didn't know who they were. We may, do a, may, we may be doing a work just as important today. We are. We're finding people that we're going to live with throughout eternity. Therefore, individually, we should follow a course of hospitality. Paul advised the Romans to share things with others and to bless people, and so he stated in Romans 12, 13, and 14. Share with the holy ones according to their needs. Follow the course of hospitality. Keep on blessing those who persecute. Be blessing and do not curse. Now here he says, with your own brothers, the holy ones, well, of course share with them according to their needs. Help them. We want to help everyone within Jehovah's organization. Then in another sentence, he puts this idea into our minds. Follow the course of hospitality. And what does it mean? follow a course of loving strangers. Now this isn't a repetition of sharing with the holy ones and then show hospitality to the holy ones. No. It's show love towards the ones within Jehovah's organization, but do more than that. Show love to strangers outside of God's organization. And now look how far he goes. He says, keep on blessing those who persecute. Imagine it. Those who are making it difficult for us to carry on the Lord's work. Those who might throw us into prison. Those who may be prison guards. Those who may stone us. Bless those who persecute you. Why? Because they're strangers. They're not of the household of God. Look at Paul. He left the group of the Pharisees with orders to go out and persecute the Christians at Damascus. And what did Christ Jesus do? He appeared before him with a brilliant light and blinded him and said, why are you persecuting me? Well, if Christ Jesus could go out of his way to be hospitable to a persecutor of his own brothers, and see in that one a possibility of his coming into the truth, why can't we be kind even to our persecutors? 
if we have good things, then we're going to share these good things with others. A hospitable person thinks of other people, not only of himself. We are told that we should love others just the way we love ourselves, and if we do, then that means towards a stranger too, not only the one within God's organization. In Romans, the 12th chapter, the 16th verse, Paul tells us, be minded the same way towards others as to yourself. Do not be minding lofty things, but be led along with the lowly things. Do not become discreet in your own eyes. Now we look upon persecuted, uh, persecutors of God's people as something very lowly, despicable. But, Paul says, be led along with those lowly things and help them, talk to them. And haven't our brothers done that? Haven't they witnessed to prison keepers? Haven't persons who have been guards or wardens in some of our prisons learned the truth there and come out taking a stand for the truth? Yes, we've seen such incidents. Haven't we seen clergymen who have directed their parishioners never to listen to Jehovah's Witnesses for them to turn around and come into the truth and take their stand on God's side? Now, if we hated those that persecuted us, then we'd never talk to them. We'd avoid them. We'd stay away from them. But our purpose in life is to love the stranger, show hospitality. You know, the world thinks we're... Uh, a little bit unbalanced because of the way we do things. And when I read you this next scripture at Matthew 5, 43 to 48, well, they might have good reason to think we're unbalanced because it works absolutely contrary to the whole system of things in this old world. But then we're not living according to an old world, we're living according to a new world. And we want to live in a new world where the whole principle of life is different from the way people live now. It was Jesus that said this, You heard that it was said, You must love your neighbor and hate your enemy. However, I say to you, Continue to love your enemies. My, what a strange thing. Continue to love your enemies and to pray for those persecuting you that you may prove yourselves sons of your Father who is in heaven. Since he makes his son rise upon wicked people and good and makes it rain upon righteous people and unrighteous. For if you love those loving you, what reward do you have? Are you not also are not uh, also the tax collectors doing the same thing? And if you uh, greet your brothers only, what extraordinary thing are you doing? Are not also the people of the nations doing the same thing? You must accordingly be complete as your heavenly Father is complete. Now here's a whole new principle or idea of way of life for every one of us to follow. It was started back there 1900 years ago with Christ Jesus for everyone who has dedicated himself to serve Jehovah. Loving your enemies and praying for those that persecute you. And if you do that, what do you prove? You prove that you're sons of the Father in heaven. You're being more like him. You're thinking like he thinks. You work like he works. Well, isn't the whole world the enemy of God? Haven't they fought against him? All the nations? He has good cause to wipe them right out, destroy them all. Why let anyone live? Especially in this day and age with their atomic bombs, their hydrogen bombs, their uh, missile bombs that they want to throw through space over a distance of 5,000 miles and destroy whole cities and whole nations of people. Why not get rid of them all? Now, if we were going to be like our Father in heaven, what did he do? 
He sent his son into the world to buy them all. And when he laid down his life on the torture stake, he bought everybody. Why? That they might have salvation. That's hospitality. That's loving the stranger. Adam and Eve took all of us away from being sons of God and made all of his offspring strangers to God. No, re no relationship to them. Look at the heathen at the time of uh, the Jews living upon the earth. It's only because God loved Abraham and made a covenant with him that he even dealt with the Jewish people. It wasn't because they were so great, so wonderful. No, it was because of Abraham, his friend, that he chose the Jewish people. But as for the rest of the world of mankind, where were they? No relationship with God at all. Oh, they knew they were alive. They were living. But now look what God did, even though he was dealing just with Abraham's offspring. He allowed the stranger to come into that organization, in with the Jews. Even when they came out of Egypt, the strangers came along. They weren't born Jews. They weren't of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But God loved the stranger. He showed hospitality towards those who were not in covenant relationship with him through Moses. Now, if God can do that, if that is his disposition and way of life to show love to strangers, and we're made in his image, and we have to prove that uh, we are his sons, then we have to be the same way. Then we have to show hospitality. We have to show love to strangers. At 1 Corinthians 4, 12 and 13, we read, When being reviled, we bless. When being persecuted, we bear up. When being defamed, we entreat. We have become as the refuse of the world, the off-scarring of all things. And we are so now. Yes, because we're that way, because we uh, bless when we're reviled, because we're kind to those that persecute us, because we're like Jesus said we should do, love our enemies and pray for those persecuting us, we look like a pretty stupid, weak-kneed bunch of people. No fight. Don't want to go out and destroy our enemies. What kind of people are you? The refuse of the earth. The off-scarring of all things. No, we don't conform to the way of life of the nations. The nations have built up a, a nationalistic spirit that... Uh, Everyone outside of uh, this border or this territory, no reason for them to be living. That was Hitler's idea. That was the national spirit of Germany. Maybe not of all the people, but it was embedded in their mind that here's a super race. And we've seen other great international powers like the British. They were a super race, and they could control great territories of land and hold other people in subjection and make them the scum of the earth. The Romans had the same idea as the Italians and the Arab states of today, many, many years ago, well, they were great powers that ruled the world. They're around Tehran ter and Babylon. The Assyrian powers, the Babylonish powers, the Greek powers, all of them were inflated with their own greatness and everybody else was lower and had to be their slaves. Well, if you showed any hospitality toward a stranger, according to the rulers of those lands and the lands of the earth today, the nations today, well, you're sort of a weakling. You're too soft. You're a sissy. But it really takes a man of power and integrity to befriend a stranger, 
to befriend the downtrodden one and then be despised by the nations. To stand alone as Christ Jesus did in his principles of living showed that he was a man of great strength, a man of God's spirit. And we see that same spirit in the apostles and the early church and we see it in Jehovah's Witnesses today. Yes, we do some peculiar things, odd things, when we examine Jehovah's Witnesses and compare them with the world and its way of running things and their principles of living and their way of life. There is no hospitality in this old world. There is no love of the stranger. The whole world is built on selfishness. What's mine is mine, and what I can get from somebody else is mine. There's no giving out. There's no wanting to share. There's no love for the stranger in this old world. Now we, a nation of people raised up by God, dedicated to him, have to think altogether differently than this old world thinks. Now, we could become very narrow-minded like some religious systems, uh, maybe like the Mennonites or the Quakers, to be extreme. We just hole up and uh, stick to our own little group and never reach out except maybe an odd neighbor here or there. We might talk to them and they might become a Mennonite. But you almost have to be born a Mennonite to, to really be a good one, otherwise you've got the wrong start. And so it is with uh, many religions of the world today. When you're born, you're, you're born in the right one. But now we can't be that narrow-minded. We know we have the right religion. We are the real worshipers of Jehovah God and we give him exclusive devotion. But what must we do in view of the fact that we have this true worship? Well, we have to show love for all the people of Christendom. All these different religious organizations in the world, we have to warm up to all the individuals in those religious organizations. And we know God hates them. We know that they're going to be destroyed. We know that Christendom is our enemy. We know that they would wipe us off the face of the earth if they could just manipulate things to do so. But what do we do? We just keep going to them all the time and preach to them. Yes, we love our persecutors, Christendom. We love the Jews, but we know they hate God. We know they're returning to Palestine just for selfish reasons. We know they uh, defame God's name and have no use for it. We know that millions of Jews are atheists, but we love the Jew. We go to him and preach, even though he just opens that little peak hole and sticks his eye out at us. <laughs> we go to Palestine with missionaries and talk for years and years. And a few Arabs come in the truth, very few Jews. <laughs> we travel around the world sending missionary out, missionaries out special pioneers, congregational publishers, and we speak plainly to them. We tell them God's going to destroy the Jewish people as a nation, as a race. They have no relationship with God, but you can get back in his organization and we'll spend time, we'll spend hours, we'll spend years studying with individuals of that Jewish race. We'll show them hospitality. The heathen, they don't want to live. They want to go into a nothingness. They want to uh, vanish from this earth and uh, drift off into sky and space at a nirvana, and there'd be nothing at all. And they don't want us around. We don't fit into their way of life. But still, we'll go to those strangers and we'll talk to them year in and year out, send missionaries in there, spend thousands and thousands of dollars to talk to those strangers. Strangers to God, haters of God, not as great a persecutor of Christians as are 
those in Christendom, but still we go to them. We are a people not desired, a people not wanted, but we must show hospitality to all of our persecutors, to the whole world, to those in the devil's organization, and tell them the way of life. Jesus did it, the apostles did it, we must do it. There is a requirement that falls upon us, very definite as to uh, showing hospitality. We can't avoid it. Our natural tendency and the way we were raised at home is probably, well, uh, be careful, don't talk to strangers. From the time you were a little bit of a girl or a little bit of a boy. Here in America, probably your mother told you and your father told you, now never get into another man's car never talk to strangers when you go out to school come right home don't go into anybody's house not deliberately probably the chances are all of you mothers have told your little girls and little boys the same thing you're afraid of strangers and you start teaching your children from the very time they're born don't trust a stranger by the time they get uh, to a position where they can protect themselves and strong enough to stand on their own feet, they have that so implanted in their minds, don't trust a stranger. Stay away from strangers. Don't let strangers in your life. Everybody outside of you and your mother and father are thieves or crooks or <laughs> delinquents. Everybody's wrong except just the people you know. But it's so contrary to the scripture. Oh, there's no need to be careless in this day and age knowing the conditions under which we live but we certainly shouldn't teach our children to hate people we're to love people don't you see how different our life must be as a Christian than uh, the training that we would get in the old world and how different it is from the whole teaching of any nation every nation teaches its people that we're the best whether it's an American, a British, a German, a French, we're the best. And you've got to fight for us and kill everybody else and make us live. Oh, love. In the minds of the rulers or of the people, and from childhood on, we're taught to hate, not to love. But God's word, his instruction for us who have made a dedication to serve him, is to love. To love people. We're no different than anyone else, just humans, born for no reason of our own. We just came into the world because of our parents, and we're just as much a stranger on this earth as anybody else is a stranger. Just because we're born under a certain flag, we're taught to hate everybody else. It even centers itself down to little towns and villages that our little town is the best. Our city is the best. Our county is the best. Our state is the best. And we're just taught all our lives to get the wrong idea about people. We can't be that way, not if we're going to be Christians. See what it says here in 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 2. If any man is reaching out for an office of overseer, he is desirous of a right kind of work. Well now, every young man who ever dedicates his life to Jehovah God and is sincerely interested in the work of God isn't going to try and crowd another person out of a position of overseer, but he would strive to that position because it has greater privileges of service, greater responsibilities, and uh, if it is Jehovah's choice through his organization ever to appoint me as an overseer, why, well, I'd be happy to take on those responsibilities. So he says, if any man is reaching out for the office of overseer, he is desirous of the right kind of work. Now, what is this work? What is this right kind of work? The overseer should therefore be irreprehensible, a husband of one wife moderate in habits, sound in mind, orderly, a lover of strangers, 
And the footnote in the New World Translation says, hospitable. So he must be orderly, hospitable, or a lover of strangers qualified to teach. Now there's one of the things that a man who uh, is striving to be an overseer or one who will help others take the lead in this work, he must love strangers. He can't be afraid of people. He must want to talk to them, welcome them in, and express to uh, these individuals that he never knew before, never saw, a welcome. So when an overseer is in a congregation, he can never get into a little clique and think that, well, these few people are my friends, and well, let the rest take care of himself. No, he must know everybody in the congregation. Glad to see them, talk to them, happy to know them and welcome them. And when he sees a stranger come into the auditorium and nobody else talks to him, if he's going to be a, a man seeking such a fine position, the office of an overseer, and he wants to do the right kind of work, he'll go up to that stranger and say, how do you do? I haven't seen you here before. It's very, very nice that you've come. My name is Mr. Brown. And what is yours? Do you know anyone of Jehovah's Witnesses? Oh, yes, I know Mrs. So-and-so. Oh, that's fine. Yes, she comes to this congregation. Get into a conversation, welcome, have them sit down, introduce them to some other people. That's welcoming the stranger. You're showing hospitality rather than seeing that, I wonder who that guy is. <laughs> he's, he's got a dirty shirt. I guess he's just a bum that floated in here. There's uh, nothing about him I like. If you're a Christian, you will like him. He's a stranger. And an overseer must have a love for strangers. Now, can we see that? It's a qualification of an overseer to love the stranger. Look at this in Titus, the first chapter, verses 7 and 8. See the contrast that uh, Paul makes here in writing to uh, Titus, the first steps that we have to correct. And then the very first thing we have to do on making those corrections. He says, for an overseer must be free from accusation as God stored. Now what must he not be? Not self-willed, not prone to wrath, not a drunkard, uh, not a drunken brawler, not a smiter, not one that fights, not greedy of dishonest gain. Now those are the things he must not be. Then what does he say all of a sudden in contrast? Well, we can't imagine a, a self-willed man uh, being friendly to strangers. That's, it doesn't work. And then uh, a man that's always prone to wrath, that's always ready to get in a scrap. Well, we can't see that he would be hospitable. Then a man who is a drunken brawler, well, there's just something we don't even like to be around. Uh, a person that is a drunken brawler, we, we stay away from him. Then uh, it says that you may not be a smiter, one who's always ready to pick a fight and start one and carries a little chip on his shoulder to well, you say something and I'll tell you off. No, you don't want to be that kind of a fellow. A person who's greedy of dishonest gain. Well, now that's what we should not be if we're going to be an overseer. But what does he say then you must be? The first thing, not prone to wrath, not a drunken brawler, not a smiter, not greedy of dishonest gain, but a lover of strangers. Anyone who has these attitudes or this principle or way of life just couldn't be a lover of a stranger, a drunken brawler, a greedy person, one who's dishonest. He just couldn't have that spirit of loving a stranger. So he makes a powerful contrast from all of this selfish way of life into, but love the stranger. Whoever he might be, show love towards him. A lover of goodness, sound in mind, righteous, having loving kindness and self-control. So you see what a big change takes place in a man's life when he dedicates his life to Jehovah God. 
his uh, his viewpoint broadens out to such a scope it takes in the whole world and that's what this uh, 30th class of Gilead is doing they're taking in the whole world in their love of strangers and when you students go out to foreign countries you missionaries you're going to meet a lot of people that uh, will wonder at you they'll look at your clothes because you're going to be dressed a little different than they are and they'll spot you right away you're an American it's the first thing they'll say you're an American when they hear your accent they may say well he's a Britisher or he's a German but uh, they'll know that you come from another civilization from some other part of the earth but I think in most instances you're going to find the people very friendly and warm to you. I've talk and talked to many missionaries in different parts of the world and this is their general consensus of opinion that all the people that they go to help and they have that spirit of helpfulness the people are glad that you an American in such a civilized country having everything in the world bathrooms, bathtubs, shower baths, washing machines, radio, television, that you should leave all of that and come here into this country and talk to us. Their immediate idea is one of admiration. That's the first thing that strikes them, to think that you would do that. Right away they love you. It may be for a selfish purpose. They may think, well now that guy's got a lot of money. <laughs> and, uh, I'm going to be friendly with him. I'll invite him in. Uh, maybe there's something in this for me. And uh, he soon finds out you're a missionary, and his first thought might be, well, uh, missionaries usually give out clothing, and missionaries usually give you some flour and sugar and maybe some foodstuffs. And, well, I can't lose. So they may show you hospitality. It may be a greedy form of hospitality. But in a few weeks after you've gone back a number of times and you've shown no idea of giving them gifts or food or clothing, there's only one thing you have to give, words of life. And they'll begin to look at you altogether differently. Now, isn't he different from other missionaries? Here he comes and studies. He stays an hour, stays an hour and a half. He doesn't mind sitting here on an old uh, orange crate or a box and uh, he comes into this uh, terrible looking hut of mine and now what is it? What's this person got that uh, I'm missing? In a short while he'll think, well, you're a very hospitable person. You certainly love strangers because I'm a stranger to you. Well, he's a stranger to me too, but He's showing love and interest in you, and you're showing love and interest in him. You're both strangers. And after a while, that person uh, begins to believe everything you say, and he sees you came for just one reason, to help him spiritually. All of a sudden, he discerns that he has a spiritual need, and he tries to satisfy that spiritual need, and you can give him that satisfaction. Soon he'll be coming to your own little uh, missionary home and you've fixed up the front room with a couple of benches or chairs and there you have a study and he finds, oh, there's a couple of people meeting with all these missionaries. I didn't know there were ten missionaries in this town or four and there's a few other people. Some of them can't even read but you help them. You teach them to read. These persons are certainly going out of their way to help me get a knowledge of the Bible. What won them? What's getting them? What's attracting them to God's organization? Your spirit. The fruits of the spirit that you have been developing over years, and they're manifesting themselves now through love and patience and long-suffering and mildness and hospitality. Your love of strangers and in a while you will build these people into a little organization and maybe after two or three years one or two of those persons can take on a responsibility of an overseer and you say well I just got a letter from the branch office 
and they say that in two months we have to go over to another town. <gasps> no, you can't leave us. Yes, they sent their district and circuit servants around and, and they say, well, this uh, little organization is strong enough to on its own and we believe that uh, you can do it. We have confidence in you. We're going 35 miles away to such and such a city and we'll visit you once in a while. Oh, you can't do that. What has happened? Their love and yours has been entwined. There's warmth there. There's really love for the stranger that brought you so close together that now you are a brother and you're a sister in God's organization. But you've trained them so well in your teaching that after several years, they see, well, it's better to uh, do what the society says. It's God's organization. And... Uh, we'll be glad that you're going over to that other city and do for those people there that you have done for us. And we'll take on the whole load of responsibility. That's why you're going out into foreign service is because you love strangers. If you don't love strangers, you'll never make a success of missionary service. Now you who are going out into the special, into the circuit work or district work, well, you might say, well, I'm going to the congregations, they're all my brothers. Yes, they're all your brothers by dedication. But they're all strangers in a sense. You don't know them. You've never been formally introduced. We don't have to be in God's organization. We can go up and talk to anyone, tell them our name and start a conversation. But in a sense, they are strangers to you and you have to be hospitable to all of these people in the congregation. When you're a circuit servant or a district servant, your time is not your own anymore. You don't start out in the morning and say, well, now I'm supposed to put in five hours today in the field service, and tonight I give an hour's talk, so I'll be working six hours, and the society gives me an allowance and pays my expenses. Now, that's all I have to give. No, not if you're a, a lover of God or want to walk in the footsteps of Christ Jesus. From the time you get up in the morning in that home of the brothers that are entertaining you, you show your spirit of hospitality. You help in the homework, you help with the dishes, you help eat the breakfast, you help clean up the table, you help take them out in the field service, you teach them from door to door, they gave to you, you give to them. And when you get to the congregational meeting, you don't go there just two minutes before time, you go there a half hour before time. You have things to do, people to talk to. You're busy all day long. You're giving. You love strangers, whether they are guests within God's organization or be people outside of God's organization. If you don't have that spirit of hospitality, you'll never make a good circuit servant or a good district servant. In fact, the more development you have or more growth of the fruits of the Spirit and the more you display them from the heart, the better circuit servant, district servant you'll make. Now, hospitality is a real necessity within Jehovah's organization. Hospitality is a responsibility. It's something you have to have and use towards your brothers and strangers. Uh, Peter was writing in 1 Peter, his first letter, the fourth chapter, the ninth verse, he said, Be hosp hospitable to one another without grumbling. Well, there are some people that can put on a front and they can uh, be kind and uh, patient and have themselves under perfect control. But inside, they're just a continuous rumble. I wish it wasn't this way. I wish that guy would get away from me. I, everybody bothered me. I have never been in a congregation. Everything is wrong in here. Well, maybe it is. That's why you're there. <laughs> you're a circuit servant, and you're to help the congregation. You're to love those people. Then you shouldn't be grumbling about your job. You shouldn't grumble because somebody's disfellowshipped and wants to talk to you. You shouldn't grumble because there's a uh, poor organization. 
He loved them. They made a mess of things, it's all stirred up and there's a lot of trouble, but if you're going to show hospitality, then you're not going to do it with a grumbling attitude. You're there to love them whether they're good or bad. If we can love our enemies, then why can't we love those who are our brothers in the truth who have made a pretty bad mess of their lives? God hasn't cast them off yet. They haven't been disfellowshipped. They might have been doing some pretty bad stuff and uh, poorly organized, but why should you grumble because you've gone into such a condition? You're there to help. Take these instructors here in the last four months or five and a half months. They might have had good cause for grumbling once in a while. Uh, the way you responded or studied your lessons or uh, the way you spoke or your short memories that uh, you couldn't remember it from one hour to the next. But why grumble? That isn't going to help. You were all strangers to uh, the instructors when they came in, practically all in the next class. Well, they've never seen the instructors and they've never seen them. And uh, they might have real cause for grumbling in the next class because many of them don't speak English. They just grumble something out. And <laughs> you can hardly understand a few of them. Oh, next week we'll start here in school in English class. As soon as they come up, uh, these uh, instructors will have to teach them very simple English, how to read and express themselves and shape their lips. And It'll be a special course for 10 days before uh, they ever start the course that you went on. Maybe because their slowness in knowledge will have to uh, change the course a little bit and not crowd them so much and teach them as many things as we... Uh, taught you but they're not going to grumble they love these strangers now when you get out into your foreign assignments just because a person doesn't understand you the first time and you have to repeat it time and time again you want to practice hospitality ungrudgingly as one translator puts it and another be ungrudgingly hospitable to one another we don't give hospitality to the people. We don't show love to strangers because we have to. We want to. Our minds have to be so transformed and changed, our way of thinking has to be bent around until we really are uh, made in the image of God, showing the attributes that he has, wisdom, justice, love, and power because that's the way he made man in the beginning. And if we had all those attributes now perfectly balanced, we'd be in pretty good shape. But uh, being born in sin and shaped in iniquity as we are, we don't have these qualities properly balanced, but we can strive to balance them. That's why the apostle in Galatian tells us that we can develop the fruits of the spirit. It can be done. It's a responsibility that we take upon ourselves when we dedicate ourselves to Jehovah's service that we can make this change, not in our own strength, but by the study of God's word and by his Holy Spirit and by bending our minds around to do the things the way that God wants, them to done, or wants it done. So hospitali hospitality is not something that we just throw on for appearance's sake. Oh, so nice to see you. No, uh, that's all uh, a bunch of junk. It's just an expression. Uh, I think our uh, British brothers here will bear it out that, uh, as many have told me in other classes, that when they witness here in the United States, they enjoy it a whole lot more than in Britain. Because in Britain you feel that uh, super sweetness of niceness at the door. Oh, how do you do? Yes. Uh, do tell me. Oh, no, not today. <laughs> and so from door to door, door to door, you get that same sweet, uh, hypocritical uh, Church of England idea, born and bred in every one of the people. And a number of the British brothers have come over here and they've gone out in this territory and wango goes the door. <laughs> oh, that's good. 
I like it. At least I know he doesn't like me and I'm saving time. But uh, so often in Britain, uh, they just can't figure him out. Well, now, does he like me or doesn't he? Well, a stranger, if they're hospitable, they'll be honest. Hospitality is not a cloak. It isn't something we put on for just a few minutes. It's us. It's what we really are. And we should show it to any stranger, any brother, any sister, any time, anywhere. And it isn't hypocritical. So, uh, it's our responsibility to uh, bring within our own control and handling these fine qualities that Jehovah God says must be ours, the fruits of the Spirit. And uh, the love of stranger is certainly one that we must show. Now, as an organization, we've shown it. When we look at the whole organization around the world, we could say as a whole that it certainly is a hospitable organization. We do love the stranger. And... Uh, we go out to the people from door to door and we witness to them. But let us not be proud of the matter as an organization. Let's really examine ourselves. It's an individual matter. The more hospitable we become individually, the finer will be the whole organization throughout the world. It's a quality we must develop not just to go from door to door and speak, but even when strangers come to our door, let's take the opportunity of hearing what they have to say, and maybe we can use that moment, that 10 minutes, that half hour, to tell that stranger that came to our door something about the truth. We may have something much better for them than they have for us. Let's welcome the stranger when we get to our own home congregations. Let's not just think that these people who I always go out in the service with are the only ones I can talk to at meeting. Let's get acquainted with them all. Let's put in practice this wonderful principle of life of loving the stranger. It is a responsibility. It's something that we must uh, take upon ourselves and we must show it. Remember years ago how David, who was anointed king, had his men out there in the countryside and staying away from Saul? And there was a very rich man, Nabal. And on a day of shearing of his sheep, why, David sent some of his men down to Nabal where the shearing was taking place, thinking that, well, We've been here quite some season now. We've protected this man's territory. We've never stole any of his sheep for our own food. We've never molested his men. Maybe he'll show some hospitality to us. Really, our presence here has been a protection to Nabal and all of his men in his fields. But Nabal showed no hospitality. He was cold and indifferent towards everything that David's men had been uh, doing around there. And so he drove him away. And the men came back to David and told him what happened. David says, put on your swords, boys. We're going after that fellow. <laughs> he isn't worth living. We'll destroy him and his men and everybody. Here we've been for quite some time. We've never molested his men. We've given him protection. We've kept his property free. We've never stolen a thing. And if that's the kind of a guy Nabal is, we'll clean him out. Well, a servant of Nabal ran home to uh, Nabal's wife, Abigail, and he told her how her husband acted. But Abigail, she knew what would happen. She had intuition. Immediately she told her servants to get one of the asses and load it down with food, pressed figs and uh, all kinds of things, and she started off with all of these provisions to meet uh, David and it saved her husband's life. It saved the life of all the men that worked in that great uh, uh, farm or whatever Nabal had. Well, Abigail didn't tell her husband right away when he came home that night what she did. 
she didn't tell him of her hospitality. He came home after his day's work and selfishly sat down and ate and got drunk. And after a while, he sobered up. And it says that his wife went telling him these things after he uh, became more sober. And his heart came to be dead inside of him, and he himself became as a stone. After that, about ten days elapsed, and then Jehovah struck Nabal so that he died. A person that shows no hospitality isn't worth having around, isn't worth the time of living. Nabal had a wonderful opportunity to hear, here to serve one of the anointed of God, the king of Israel, and he refused after he had given him all that protection and never molested him at all. Maybe a lot of people give us protection and help and show kindness towards us, but we never reciprocate. We don't have to, no. But it would be so much finer if we did show that love to strangers. It's a necessary responsibility to show this love. Jesus said, or rather it's recorded in Acts 21, 13, <clears throat> about Paul, his interest in carrying out his responsibility. <clears throat> Some of the folks were telling him, well, don't go ahead with this uh, trip into Jerusalem. But Paul said, rest assured, I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wasn't afraid to go back into Jerusalem there and even lose his life for the kingdom's sake and to speak to people about the truth. And then we know the man with the writer's ink horn, he came back and said, I have done as thou hast commanded me. He was sure of himself. Paul tried to make Timothy see his responsibilities in his preaching work, and he said, I earnestly beg you before God and Christ, who is uh, destined to judge the living and the dead, and by his manifestation of his kingdom, preach the word be it at urgently in favorable season, in troublesome season. Reprove, reprimand, exhort with all long suffering and art of teaching. Don't just think that we can preach this good news of the kingdom at times that it's always favorable to us when everything is nice. But even in persecution, even in trials and difficulties, show your love for strangers in favorable season, in troublesome season. Again, Paul said, I have fought the right fight. I have run the course to the finish. I have observed the faith. From this time on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me as a reward in that day, yet not only to me, but also to all those who have loved his manifestation. Paul was sure of himself after he had done his preaching work, after he shown love to strangers, and he certainly did, going to Asia Minor, to Greece, to Rome, covered all that territory, established one congregation after another, all strangers to Paul, for he was a Jew, a Pharisee. And now he goes out into new lands and brings strangers into God's organization. And when he was finished, he was confident that he had done right there was no doubting in his mind as to his faithfulness. What happens when responsibility is faithfully born? Jesus states it very beautifully at Luke 22, 28 to 30. However, you are the ones that have stuck with me in my trials. Yes, even Jesus in all of his trials had those that stayed by him and he said, I have made a covenant with you, just as my Father has made a covenant with me for a kingdom, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones to judge the twelve tribes of Israel. Jesus rewarded those who were faithfully carrying out the work that he had assigned them to do. And so now in these last days, we have to keep awake and pay attention to ourselves, for we see the consummation of these things. 
And we have to show hospitality, love of strangers, and preach this good news. And Jesus said, as a strong admonition to the apostles and to us today, this in Luke 21, 34 to 36, but pay attention to yourselves that your hearts never become weighed down with overeating and heavy drinking and anxieties of life, and suddenly that day be instantly upon you as a snare. For it will come in upon all those dwelling upon the face of the earth. Keep awake, then, all the time making supplication that you may succeed in escaping all these things that are destined to occur and to hold your position before the Son of Man. We can hold that position in Jehovah's organization in these last days, which Jesus is describing here in Luke 21, and be faithful. We can hold it by showing hospitality. Hospitality is a responsibility that falls upon every one of us. You of the 30th class have learned many other very important things and principles and ways of life from God's word as you have studied it in five and a half months. But I just wanted to leave this one thought with you on hospitality because you'll certainly have to show it in foreign lands and they will show it to you. And you circuit servants, special pioneers, wherever you work, show hospitality. Show a love to strangers. So we come to a time now when uh, you wonder if you're going to get a diploma or not. The diploma isn't an important thing. It's a piece of paper that I think the majority of the students after they leave here uh, get it down into the bottom of their trunk. They take it with them. But after they get away, they are so busy that they never have time to dig to the bottom of the trunk to see what it looks like. Here at school, you've made notes, uh, my goodness, the notes you've made. <laughs> you've written and you've written and you've kept them all and you've put them in loose, new, loose leaf notebooks and you've got stacks of them. And you all have good intentions. You're going to take those along and you're going to look them over when you get in the foreign assignment. Or you're going to look them over sometime in a year or so when you get out in the field service as a circuit servant. But you never will. You'll, you'll never find the time. It's just like saving letters that you thought, well, I'll read this a little later on, and it's so good, it's so well written, and I, it brings black present memories. But you never get around to read it. Because a new letter comes, new things happen in your life, your interest will be so great in other people that pretty soon these notes that you've taken will all begin to fade away and you'll keep them at the bottom of the trunk with your diploma. The thing you'll never forget are the things you've learned, the things that you've stored away in your mind. What's on paper, that's no good. It's of no value to you particularly. If we want to find it, we can find it in books. You'll have your reference books with you, you'll have them at home on the shelf, and somebody will ask you a question, you'll say, well, I." I used to know that at school. In fact, I failed at school, and I remembered it then, and goodness sakes, I forgot it again. But I'll tell you tomorrow. I'll come back here on my way to the field service and drop in. I'll show you just where to find it. So you go home, and in books you can find it. We have indexes. We have cross-references. And sometimes you'll ask another missionary, now, where was that? And they'll help you. You can find it. If you're given time enough and you have enough books or references, you'll get it. There's no uh, doubt about it but you don't always keep it up here. But what we really are interested in and where you will be of benefit to the stranger is what you have stored away in your mind. Whether it's much or little, you'll use it. So you're having stored away things in your mind, uh, you're in a position to help the stranger, to show hospitality. 
For if you meet him on a street corner, or if you meet him in a store, or you visit some people at their home, and persons you have never met are there, strangers, why well, you're always ready to talk. How wonderful Jehovah has been to us uh, that we didn't always have to go to a book to find the answer. Uh, we can reason it out in our own minds because of the principles uh, that have been established there and ideas that we know are correct. And we can always start out from there and we keep ourselves going in the right direction. We use the right argument, the right logic. That's because we've trained our hearts and minds. Now that's really all you're going to take away from here. So while we pass out diplomas, they're not important. What's in your head is important. What's in your heart is more important. Because if your heart is right towards Jehovah and your heart is right towards strangers and towards your brothers, then you're going to have a happy life. But if your heart isn't right towards other people, you'll just be a miserable person. Our enjoyment in living comes in being with people, associating with them, exchanging ideas. And uh, as I told some folks yesterday, and it was absolutely true, they asked me a question, well, uh, what do your missionaries do? What do they get out of life uh, in these far missionary service? What do you give them? Well, all we give them is a home to live in and we give them enough food so they never get hungry. But the thing they want is the pleasure of talking to somebody. Our whole satisfaction and enjoyment in living comes in finding a person that wants to hear the truth. That's our life. Now that to you may sound very strange and uh, uh, it, there's nothing to it. But to us it's a whole thing in our lives is to be able to talk to somebody about the Bible and to get them interested in Bible study. That's where we live. That's our food. That's our meat. That's our drink. It was Jesus and it's really yours. Your greatest enjoyment in living in a foreign assignment or even in a circuit servant's mission or being at Bethel is when you can talk the truth to a stranger or talk to your own brother and help him with his problem and build him up. That's when you get warm inside. That's when you get a little tingle in your back and you just enjoy it. They, uh, they don't tell you that uh, what you've said has been so wonderful, but you've started them in the right course. You don't hang a medal on you every time you bring somebody in the truth, <laughs> like you do uh, in the army. Every time they've been in a battle, they get some kind of a ribbon or a medal or something that they have made so many uh, battles or fought in them. No, but where our joy comes is that person has dedicated himself and due to my good efforts that person and that person we don't brag about it but after a year's time is over we sort of feel well I did some good here I'm glad I came and after you get a little congregation going and they're on their own and you're off into a new town and you start from absolute scratch not a person in the truth the first home you knock on uh, might, the uh, door you knock on might be a person that will come in the truth and he might be one that will slam it in your face, but it doesn't make any difference. You're only looking for one thing, that person that wants to study the Bible. And when you find them, what do you do when you come home? You tell all the other missionaries, did I have a good time this morning? And then you go and start telling them everything you said and they know it just as well as you do. They, uh, you explain to them all about the hell and all about the soul and all about where are the dead. We had it here in class. They've spoken it a hundred times. But you just so enriched. Oh, it was wonderful. I told them this and that. You might talk an hour or maybe two hours. What's happened to you? You've given. You've poured it out. You've been hospitable. That's your life. 
And as long as that's your life, you're going to be a happy person. So uh, don't worry about a diploma. There will be a few in this class that just didn't make a certain mark uh, that we have set that either you get a diploma or you don't. The diploma says you've made the grade. But I can comfort you with this thought that I know brothers that are off in missionary work that, and sisters that haven't got diplomas. In fact, I have one brother in mind right now that uh, is off on a foreign assignment, been off now for uh, 12 years. And I still see him here uh, after the graduation exercise saying, well, Brother Nor, if we'd have had school just about three or four weeks longer, I'd have made it. But he says, it's all right. I'm glad that I'm going out on a foreign assignment. That brother has brought more people into the truth in that country than any other person. Than all the persons that have had diplomas. I don't know whether diplomas are an advantage or a disadvantage. <laughs> but I know his heart's right. I'd like to give him a diploma. I'm sure that he knows how to preach the good news of the kingdom, but he's just a little bit slow. And some of you here have been a little bit slow. The majority by far, of course, are going to get diplomas because you were able to give us the right answers at the right time. But don't let a diploma discourage you. In fact, all of you have your assignments now. All of you know where you're going whether you get a diploma or not doesn't make any difference to the society. There's one thing we know. We know you're dedicated to Jehovah God, you love him with all your heart, and you've said, here am I, send me. And that's all that counts with us. The only reason we brought you here is to help you out for five months before we send you to a faraway place so that you might be better equipped, and all of you are much better equipped than when you came here. And that makes us very happy. So as I call your names this morning, why uh, you can come up here and uh, I'll just repeat and tell the audience here where you're going. And uh, if I've made a change on you in the meantime, don't let it shock you. <laughs> well, Brother Abora, I... Arbor, I guess you're the first one to come up here. And you're going to go to Paraguay, Brother Arbor is going to Paraguay. And Sister Argadine <laughs> to Peru. She's Brother Bogus is going to Haiti. Hope you know French. <laughs> and um, Brother and Sister Bolton, you're going far away, huh? Headhunters. <laughs> <laughs> Down in the uh, land in the uh, South Pacific, where there used to be headhunters, but I hope they don't catch up to you. <laughs> and here's uh, Brother Bright going to Paraguay. And uh, Brother and Sister Brown, they're going into the circuit work here in the United States. And uh, Brother Buckingham and his wife, she didn't make it. She's not well this morning. We're sorry she couldn't be here, so you'll have to take two diplomas. Going into circuit work in England for a while, and then we'll have them something else to do. And uh, Brother and Sister Carol, they're going to Honduras. <coughs> and Brother and Sister Coates, isn't it? You're going into the circuit work in the United States. Several of us discussed the matter with them and they, many of them expressed their thoughts and we've tried to incorporate uh, these thoughts together into this presentation which we've called Resolution and Statement of Appreciation prepared by the 30th class. We, the 30th class of Gilead, on graduation day, desire to express verbally before our Heavenly Father, Jehovah, our reigning King, Christ Jesus, all the heavenly host of protector angels, and our many friends, 
the feelings we have upon completion of this course in highest learning. From all our hearts, we say the loving kindness of our Father is boundless toward us. His riches are beyond description. Our cup of joy has run over e each day of these past 23 weeks. Getting a clearer picture of the profound truths contained in the Bible has been our greatest joy. The righteous principles deeply impressed upon our minds will be a sure guide for our feet. Having been brought so much closer to Jehovah and Christ Jesus through this wonderful rehearsal of truth, we leave this place for different parts of the earth with renewed strength and fearlessness. To and through our dear brother Nor, representative of the governing body of the faithful and discreet slave and of the legal society, we express heartfelt appreciation for the privilege of having been here, for the loving arrangements spiritually and physically while we have studied here, and for the personal interest manifest toward each one of us. It causes our hearts to overflow with gratitude and thanksgiving which we desire to demonstrate wherever we go. Further, to the four instructors whose diligence, persistence, and above all, patience and example of Christian love have made our progress possible, and who have served as such outstanding examples of the oneness and humility that mark Jehovah's people, we wish to express special appreciation. They have been a direct contact between us and the governing body. Their fine example of Christian love and maturity will continue with us in the service in all parts of the earth. We are very grateful to the farm servant and to the farm family whose spirit has made us so welcome here. Their labor of love provided us with most pleasant and comfortable physical surroundings, wholesome and clean. Also included is our wholehearted thanks to the thousands of brothers throughout the earth whose regular, unselfish contributions to the society has made possible our new world training at this wonderful place. Our training at Gilead has brought more forcefully to our attention the constant need for Jehovah's spirit and blessing, the depth and power of his word, the positiveness of his now reigning kingdom, and the bond of love, unity, and humility marking the New World Society today. It has impressed upon us the need for constant study and meditation, the family spirit of a theocratic organization, and the manner of living that should mark our lives in a progressive, productive ministry as we live now in the New World Society. We are determined to use this knowledge and training in the manner the great sovereign Jehovah intended. Eagerly and gratefully, we look forward to our assignments and resolve individually and collectively as a class not to miss the purpose of Jehovah's loving kindness to us, but to teach others by word and example. In faithfulness and loyalty to Jehovah's visible organization, at any time, in any place and under any circumstances, anywhere on this earth, just as we have been taught at this place. With wholehearted thanks, warm appreciation, and a firm determination to walk in our integrity, we close this chapter in the life of the 30th class of Gilead. This is certainly an excellent expression and a fine statement of uh, your appreciation of being here, and we believe it with all our hearts. It's wonderful to come from different parts of the earth, different parts of a country, as you have from Canada and United States and across the seas, and to dwell again, to dwell together in unity as you have. You have been a very happy class. It has been a joy to be with you. 
And now as you get scattered abroad, I'll have the opportunity by Jehovah's undeserved kindness to visit you from time to time. I know that uh, at the moment you have heartstrings for uh, staying here because uh, you'd like to be at the convention this summer. But then, uh, as was explained to you, many of our brothers in foreign countries would like to be here too. So we're sending this uh, graduating class of Gilead out within the next few weeks. Many of their passages have already been obtained on airlines and by boat and other means of transportation. And it won't be long until about half of this class is on their way to foreign assignments and Jehovah's rich blessing will go with all of you. We do appreciate uh, the uh, joy with which you accepted your assignments and we feel certain that your presence in other countries with fellow missionaries and other workers will really be a stimulant to them. As our telegrams have shown us this morning, uh, they want you to come and of course we want you to go. We're glad that you've been with us for these five and a half months and uh, we'll never forget the uh, joys and pleasures we've had here in the association one with the other. The circuit servants and district servants we'll probably see again uh, soon within about six months in New York City and all of you too.